<laughs> thank you. Great. Thank you, Sarah, for the introduction. And it's, uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to be able to be here in a situation I wouldn't normally be able to, to come. So that's uh, very nice. And just to say, because I am doing a board talk, um, if you want to keep your cameras on, you don't have to, but I, I can see you. Um, so that's quite nice because then I can interact with you a little bit if you've had if you want to, but um, otherwise you don't need to. Um, and also, if you have trouble seeing the board, um, just unmute or wave or or whatever, and, and let me know, and I'll write a bit bigger because I've done this once before live on Zoom and it worked okay. So ho hopefully, hopefully it works again now. Um, yeah. So as Sarah said, I'm going to talk about. Um, for its hits trees specifically as, as a tool in isogeny based cryptography. Um, so given, given some of the members of your universities who are part of this, I think that probably most of you have at least seen a talk on isogeny based cryptography before. Um, but it's, it's roughly based on isogeny graphs of elliptic curves and I'll, I'll talk about exactly what I mean by that in a second. Um, and what I'm going to talk about today is joint work with Laya Amoros Trying to say people in alphabetical order. <laughs> a is easy. Laya Amaros, Anna Maria Yetzi, Kristen Lauter, and Yana Sotakova. And um, our aim in the paper is to show you just how explicit and easy Groet Tits trees can be. Um, and we really hope that this can be um, a useful tool in cryptanalysis, which is trying to assess how safe a crypto scheme is um, of a of an uh, isogeny graph based crypto system. So roughly speaking, um, I'm going to talk about sort of three categories. That's why I split my board in three. And um, so one of the categories is going to be elliptic curves and isogenies, which is the sort of, that's where the, the crypto, crypto system comes from. Another of the categories is something that if you are somebody who works already in isogeny based cryptography, like Sarah or Kate, um, then you will probably be fairly familiar with, which is quaternion algebras and left ideals of those. Um, but I will explain what that is, because I know that it can be a little bit on the edge for, for some people. And the third category is, of course, the Brut Tits trees that I'm, that I'm going to talk about here, and specifically a, a nice quotient of, of, of an infinite tree that makes it into a finite object that we can compare with our other things. All of my elliptic curves are going to be over finite fields, and in fact, um, they're going to be over a finite field of large characteristics, so that will make all your dogs happy if you were here for the beginning, and all of your cats unhappy, but that's how cats generally exist, so they won't mind. Um, so whenever I say P, it's always going to be a large prime, and here I really mean large, I'm talking, you know, something in the order of um, 2 to the uh, 512, obviously that's not a prime, but for example, two to the 521 minus one is a prime number. So that's what, that's the of size. And L will be a small prime, which necessarily is not P because uh, P was large and large is not small. Um, and if you want, if you like thinking about concrete things, then really almost always we're saying uh, L is equal to two or three for the purposes of this talk. Okay, so first of all, let's set up our middle category. So this is the one that's sort of motivating everything else, which is really about understanding the isogeny graphs of elliptic curves. So here we're talking about an L isogeny graph of elliptic curves. So I apologize if I'm using the word category a little bit sloppily here, right? So. Uh, roughly speaking, this sits within the category of elliptic curves, uh, but I'm actually only going to talk about a very specific part of that category. I'm going to talk about elliptic curves and isogenies between them of degree L. Um, so we're always thinking about, uh, this is always thinking about graphs. So graphs, we want to define a graph, we need to know what the nodes are, and we need to know what the edges are. So in this case, I'm going to restrict to I'm going to restrict to something um, uh, specific, which is I'm going to say, not just take any old elliptic curves, but I'm going to actually take a very small subgraph. I'm going to take the super singular elliptic curves. Defined over the algebraic closure 
of FP, where P is the large prime that we fixed at the beginning. And in case you're thinking, I know that sometime in my life I learned what super singular meant, but I forgot. And um, all it means is that there are no points of order P. Um, so it's not, not too mysterious. And we're going to take our nodes up to isomorphism. Um, so each node in our graph is going to represent an isomorphism class of super singular elliptic curves defined over FP bar. And so, okay, that's our nodes. What about our edges? Well, this is something you can maybe already make an educated guess on if you think about it a little bit. So an edge needs to connect two nodes, right? So if you've got two nodes, you've got two, well, isomorphism classes of elliptic curves, but let's first think to just think about two elliptic curves to make it a bit easier. So I've got an E and I've got an E prime. Our graphs are gonna be undirected, which makes it a little bit less obvious. But so here you have a line between these two between these two elliptic curves. And well, this is going to, we're going to want this to be a sort of identification of two arrows in the category of elliptic curves. And what's an arrow there? Well, that's an isogeny, which is just a subjective morphism. And the L here tells us something about the degree of that morphism. So what do our edges, well, uh, what do our edges represent? Well, this line here, um, this represents two ally such needs defined over FP bar. One taking E to E prime and it's two ally such need which takes E prime back to E. And this is also going to be up to something. So before I say what the something is, I just want to uh, hopefully recall, but if not, then define what an L isogeny is. Um, so an L isogeny, this in the case of elliptic curves, rather than abelian varieties where it gets a little bit more complicated, it's really just a subjective morphism And it also has finite kernel and since um, L is not P, you can actually think of an L isogeny as being um, an isogeny where the kernel has size L. Um, so in general, this is the degree of the morphism, uh, but in this, in this nice case, we can actually have this very easy characterization of the degree. Um, so uh, so I, that ex hopefully explains the F. And with the F dual, again, let's, let's recall. Um, so there is a, uh, given, given a uh, L-isogeny F, there exists a unique, L isogeny F dual going backwards from E dual to E, so E, E prime to E, such that um, if you compose F with F dual, or you compose uh, F dual with F, then you get the multiplication by L map, right? So then here L is just a morphism that takes a point on your elliptic curve and maps it to L times that point. Okay, so our nodes are super singular elliptic curves up to isomorphism, defined over the algebraic closure of FP. And our edges are pairs of L isogenies, one going one way, one going the other, between these two elliptic curves. But I haven't sort of explained the up to my isomorphism bit yet. So we also identify all of these isogenies up to post-composition with um, automorphisms. And that makes sure that we don't get sort of messy stuff going on. So I'm just going to write this uh, little very vague squiggle here. And um, you can, if you 
if you need things to be more precise and you forget them, do your mute and, and just ask what was that again. Now, if you make all of these uh, all of these choices, how to do the subtle isomorphism. Um, so in the case of super singular curves, we have this very, very nice theorem, which says that in every isomorphism class of super singular elliptic curves defined over F bar, FP bar, there exists a representative um, defined over FP squared. So we can replace this FP bar with an FP squared. And suddenly it's quote unquote obvious that our graph is finite, right? It, it has definitely no more than P squared vertices, thinking of J and their rates. Um, and in fact, it has, a, it has quite a few less than that. But so it's a finite graph. And moreover, it's also um, L plus one regular because every single, um, we're taking every isogeny right up to the algebraic closure. And if you just think of this as a group theoretic problem, you can sort of count, count the options, but don't worry about that. Just take my word for it for now, and we'll come back to it later. So this, this definition here, this gives us an L plus one regular finite, one more word I want to put here, connected graph. So if you're more familiar with ordinary elliptic curves than super singular elliptic curves, you'll be thinking, why on earth is this connected? Um, and sort of an easy proof of that is, um, so a, cur a curve over uh, FP squared is super singular, if and only if it has, um, I, try, I need to make sure I get the number right, P squared plus one points. Uh, if and only have a certain number of points, it has trace zero, um, the Frobenius has trace zero. So every super singular elliptic curve defined over FP squared has the same number of points. And then by Tate's isogeny theorem, they're all isogenous. Now it's still not a priori obvious that it's also isogenous with a chain of isogenies of this degree. So you do have another step, but anyway, the point is you get an L plus one regular finite connected graph. So these are the objects that we, that we study in, in cryptography that I'll, I'll come back to how they come up in, in cryptography a bit later, do the number theory first. This is a number theory seminar after all. Um, so before I move on to our next world, which is gonna be quaternion, uh, quaternion algebras, are there any questions about this definition? No? Okay, great. All right, so this is world number one. And this is going to be very close related, closely related to these other two worlds. So next I'm going to talk about quaternion order graphs. And so in this graph, the quaternion orders are going to play the role, they're going to be maximal orders, and they're going to play the role of the elliptic curves. And L ideals, uh, sorry, left ideals of norm L are going to play the role of the isogenies. Okay, so just like we did with the isogeny graph, I'm going to define the nodes and I'm going to define the edges. Uh, but first, I'm just going to pick a specific quaternion algebra. So I'm going to denote this quaternion algebra B, P, and infinity, where P is the same P it's been all along. And this is a uh, this is a Q algebra, which is going to be generated by one I, J, and K, where I squared is going to be minus one, J squared is going to be minus P. So this is like saying the quaternion, we're looking at a quaternion algebra of discriminant P and K is going to be I times J. Okay, so there are plenty of more, plenty more quaternion algebras out there, but it turns out this is the one that um, helps us study this, this picture here. So this is the one we focus on when we're looking at um, questions that are actually really about elliptic curves in disguise. So what are our nodes? 
So here, instead of taking super singular elliptic curves, our nodes are going to be maximal orders in this algebra of BP infinity. And then instead of up to isomorphism, we take it up to conjugation, which is essentially just a notion of isomorphism in this category. And up to, uh, so if you don't take it up to conjugation, there are infinitely many maximal orders. Um, if you do take it up to conjugation, then there are finitely many and, well, a comparable number to the number of elliptic curves. So if you're used to number fields, this seems very wild, um, but, but it's fun, so that's fine. Right, so conjugation here is just what you'd expect it to be. It's just taking an element of the, of the algebra and sort of multiplying your order on one side by alpha inverse and on the other side by alpha, right? So note that this thing is non-commutative. So um, I should maybe say that this is minus ji anti-commutative. So this is, um, this is not going to just collapse into the same thing. Okay, so there are nodes. And how do you connect two things like this? Well, this, this part is sort of akin to the number field situation, which is you take these sort of index ideals that you might get if you compare two orders, not maximal orders, but two orders in a, in a number field. So let's do the same thing. We'll write down two nodes. We'll write down an edge between them and say what that edge represents. So if we've got a maximal order O, and a maximal order O prime, what does, it, what does it mean if we draw an edge between them? Well, this represents left ideals. It's going to represent two left ideals um, of norm L. Right, so one will be a left ideal of O, and one will be a left ideal of O prime. And I'm going to tell you, uh, actually, yeah, sorry, I decided to do this in a slightly different way because I thought it was easier. <laughs> sorry, this represents a left ideal I of O of norm L, such that um, O prime is equal to what's called the right order of I. I do hope I get all these lefts and rights correct. I always get very confused. Which, if you're used to, again, if you're used to number fields, this will hopefully look a little bit familiar. So this is the set of all the alphas such that if you right multiply I by alpha, you land back in I, where alpha is taken from the, the algebra. And if that's equal to the maximum order O prime, then O prime is the right order of the left ideal I. And O, um, this, is, this is actually just saying that O I is a left ideal of O. Um, so all the alphas where you left multiply I and you land back in I um, as alpha runs over everything in the algebra. Um, is the same thing as, as this order O. Um, so that also gives you this sort of symmetric property. And we could equivalently have said, well, this represents a left ideal I prime of O prime, where you then switch these two things around, right? So that's the sort of F and the F dual that you have over here. Okay, so our nodes are maximal orders. Our edges are left ideals that we say links these maximal orders. And links is just that defined in the way that I've just written down here. Um, and again, this is going to give us an L plus one regular finite connected graph. It won't be exactly the same as the one in the middle. But once I've defined all my worlds, I'll tell you how to move between them. And then we'll see what the, um, we'll see exactly how, how it relates. To that. Okay, so this is world number two. Are there any questions about that before I move on to world number three? Yeah, what is exactly the connection between O and O prime? That the alphas are the same, 
that the eyes are the same? Which, which is that? So the connection between O and O prime is that there exists a left ideal I of O uh, that, satis that satisfies these two equations here. Right? So the alphas are, are running over everything in the algebra. Okay, so this bottom one is just okay. saying that I is a left ideal of O and this top one is saying that O prime is the right order for I. Yeah, thanks. Any other questions? Oh, this is very cool. uh, sorry. I may have missed it. Have you said how these graphs compare, or is that is that coming? I haven't yet, but I okay. but I will. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Can I ask how you would calculate I? Um. Yes. <laughs> uh, so one way of doing it is you look at the uh, the bases. You, you, if you can compute it, kind of depends what you know about O and O prime. But if you know the bases of O and O prime, then you can uh, compute essentially a basis of I as a as a Z module. And um, just by sort of doing your favorite linear algebra reduction on the on the matrices. It's not a very insightful way of doing it, but that's how I would do it. Fair enough, that makes sense. Any other questions? This is great. I love questions, <laughs> especially virtually, because then you know that people are, can, can hear you and everything's all right. Good. OK, so now our last world, which um, I expect will be the one that there's the least people familiar with, but maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Um, it's going to be about Baruchit's trees. So I'm not going to go into all of the def, like all of the fun and exciting uh, geometry behind it just because that's not really within scope of, of what we're doing. You can read our paper if you want to know some more about that. <laughs> um, but I am going to try and give you an, uh, an idea of how easy it is to compute with them and how they relate to the other two worlds. So world number three is Burek Tits Trees. And if you're really thinking of these three worlds comparing, um, I should really write here a quotient of a Bruet Tits tree rather than all Bruet Tits trees um, before quotienting. And I'm going to really talk about Bruet one, just like I spoke about one specific quaternion algebra, I'm going to talk about one specific Bruet Tits tree and a quotient of that, of that tree. So um, my version of, of Bruet Tits trees for this talk is going to be probably simpler than, than what you might have come across before. Um, every, every node in the tree, I'm going to do exactly the same as I did before. Um, I'm going to just define the nodes and the edges. Every node in my tree is just going to be a matrix, a two by two matrix with entries in M2 QL of the form L to the N O R L to the N, where uh, I'm pretty sure this formula I've got here is wrong. <laughs> Zero is less than or equal to R is less than L to the N plus N. And um, this is going to be then a subspace of two by two matrices with entries in QL. In fact, as I've written, it's even a subset of, of ZL. Um, but it's useful later to think of it as being in QL because sometimes we want to um, look at the inverses of these matrices and things. And why would, why is that, why would that something, be something that makes sense? Well, this is going to be this set, just like we took this up to isomorphism, this up to conjugation, this is going to be up to an equivalence where that equivalence is actually the key that makes this all work, but it's also, <laughs> it's also a little bit involved. So it's not just going to be an equivalence on the vertices um, that you might expect a sort of PGL to ZL type equivalence or something like that, but it's actually a, um, a, a, different, a different matrix group that's defined via this quaternion story here. Um, but for now, it suffices just to say that it's an explicitly computable matrix group that we quotient out by 
And then even if we let n and m range to infinity, we get a finite graph, which is going to actually be a uh, two to one. Uh, so this is going to be a two to one cover of this graph. So it's exactly half the size of this one here, which is pretty cool. Well, once I define the edges. <laughs> okay, so that's my, that's my nodes and my edges. Um, are just going to be, uh, again, so what did we do before? We have two nodes, we drew a line between them and we said, um, when do we draw a line between these two things? And it's as simple as you might expect it to be, it's literally just matrix multiplication. So a line between these two things represents um, a gamma such that Make sure I multiply it the right way around. M gamma is equal to M prime and a gamma dual, I'm going to call it dual just to, just to have the comparison with the elliptic curves. Um, but it sounds, sounds a bit overly complicated for matrices. But <laughs> and a gamma dual such that uh, M prime gamma dual is equal to M where um, we're not even going to have like a vague condition saying it's got determinant L or something. I'm really going to say where gamma is one of the following matrices. It's either one zero I L where um, I runs from zero up to L minus one or it's L zero, zero, one. And then again, we're going to need to take this set and modulo out by this magical equivalence that I'm, um, that I'm not really going into more detail on. So this is again going to give us an L plus one regular finite connected graph. Once we've modulated out by this equivalence. And I'll explain exactly how to explicitly how to move between these worlds um, just in a minute once, once we've absorbed this part. Um, but you can see already that here we're really talking about two by two matrices with a very simple representation. And we're talking about um, edges which are the same throughout the whole graph and have these very simple representatives here. And this is kind of what led us to study this as we thought, come on, this is so simple. Matrices are also really quick, two by two matrices are really quick to, to compute with. So you might be able to really say something interesting about the you know, graph elliptic curves, which you, you can't do when you're doing something more complicated, computing sort of algebraic maps and that kind of thing. Okay, so before I go on to uh, how to relate these things to each other, are there any questions about this? Apart from what's the equivalence, because I'm not going to go into that. <laughs> we didn't have long enough. No, okay. So I suggest that you take a screenshot if you're not taking notes, and um, so that you have all these definitions before I, before I rub stuff out. So I'm going to start with the um, perhaps best known uh, relationship between these things, at least among people who study these objects on a daily basis, which is how to go from uh, this picture here to this picture here. So the elliptic curve picture to the quaternion order picture. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna rub out this, this left bit here. So this is a classical result. Um, due to uh, Doering, called Doering correspondence, which goes both directions, but I'm only gonna really talk about one because that's uh, easier to write down. So, and this is, the fundamental idea is that uh, if you've got a super singular elliptic curve defined over FP bar, it's an amorphous ring defined over FP bar is a maximal order in the quaternion algebra that I wrote down before. 
Um, so I am just going to recall a couple of things about endomorphisms, especially with respect to uh, elliptic curves, super singular elliptic curves over finite fields. So an endomorphism uh, of an elliptic curve E is a morphism that maps E to itself, a morphism of elliptic curves that maps E to itself. So we've already seen one example, which is actually here multiplication by LMAP and of course you can you can do that for any integer because our elliptic curve is a group so we can add a point to itself as many times as we might want to so on any elliptic curve you've already got infinitely many endomorphisms whether or not it's defined over a finite field um, for n and an integer just taking p to n times p right? that's infinitely many endomorphisms already um, if you've got an elliptic curve defined over a finite field, as we're doing here, then you also have a um, something called the, the Frobenius uh, endomorphism, which again, probably most of you have heard of before. So I'm going to actually talk about a little bit of a more special case than, than we're in here, just to make it a bit uh, concrete. So if you've got, uh, this is also an example, if you've got an elliptic curve defined over fp rather than fp squared or fp bar, um, then you can define uh, something that's often called pi, the Frobenius uh, endomorphism that maps E to E, which takes um, a point xy in, in the algebraic closure of, um, of fp on E and maps it to x to the p, y to the p. And this is, it turns out, really an endomorphism, maps E to itself, so long as E is defined over FP. Um, and uh, when, so this is, this is true for any elliptic curve over a finite field. And if it's super singular, then you get something even nicer, which is that if you compose the Frobenius endomorphism with itself, then you get the multiplication by minus p map on the elliptic curve. So when we're trying, remember we're trying to get from here, from thinking of endomorphisms elliptic curves to elements of a Gottonian algebra. So here, here there's, in this first example, you can kind of naturally associate each of these endomorphisms with an integer n, right? So that's, that, one's, that one's natural. In the second, ex, in the second example, for the super singular case, you can naturally associate this Frobenius endomorphism with a square root of minus p. And if you remember, um, in our choice of quaternion algebra, we had j squared is equal to minus p. So what we do is we sort of naturally associate, we're going to define a, a ring um, isomorphism between the endomorphism ring and this maximal order in our uh, quaternion algebra. We associate pi to the quaternion element j, because j squared is minus p, so that's a natural thing to do. That doesn't give us enough, because our quaternion algebra is a, a rank 4 q algebra. <laughs> right? We've only got, uh, we've only got rank 2 at the moment, we've got uh, 1 and j. Now, again, I'm going to specialise even further. I'm just I'm pick, making my example as easy as possible, just so at least you've got an example to think about, but it does work in more generality. Um, so then if you pick a very, I'm going to now pick a specific elliptic curve, E0, I'm going to call it E0, um, which is y squared is equal to x cubed plus x. So on this elliptic curve, we've got an endomorphism E0 to E0 that takes xy to minus x and i times y. Now, as always, I'm thinking of my elliptic curve as being defined over a finite field. So here it's fp. Now, we suppose it's a p where i is um, i would be in an algebraic extension of fp. So minus 1 is a quadratic non-residue. Then, um, 
and, and what we get here is if I call this map Yota, then just in the same way we did with the Frobenius, we can look at Yota composed with itself. And that's going to give us the multiplication by minus one map on our elliptic curve E0. So then, for at least for this example, for E0, we can naturally associate uh, Yota to I. If you remember, I squared was equal to minus one in this quaternion algebra. And then, of course, we can compose uh, Yota and Frobenius, and then we get Ij as K. And at least we get a subring of, um, of a maximal order in our quaternion algebra. And it turns out that actually um, this will be, in general, a, a maximal order. Um, so, I didn't, I wrote too big. <laughs> uh, I'm going to rub out this top bit. I'll wait for you to take a screenshot if you need. Okay, so here's a fact which I'm just going to state and not really explain further, so sorry about that. Um, the set of endomorphisms of any elliptic curve forms a ring called the endomorphism ring. And We've just seen an example, this particular E0 over FP, where E0 is defined by Y squared equals X cubed plus X, um, where we can see a ring. Once we know it's a ring, we can, we can at least see a ring that's contained inside there. So the endomorphism ring of E0, where E0 is this curve defined over FP, contains all of the integers the yota composed with any integer map, the Frobenius con uh, composed with any integer map, and yota and the Frobenius contained with any integer uh, composed with any integer map. And then you can also add these things using this ring structure that I've just told you exists. Um, and this is this is actually not a maximal order in this case. Um, you end up with some denominators of, of two floating around as well. Uh, but it's almost, <laughs> it's almost a maximum order. Um, and it turns out, here's another fact, that um, if you have a super singular elliptic curve defined over the algebraic closure of FP, um, then its endomorphism ring is a maximal order in uh, in BP infinity, where BP infinity is the uh, algebra that I defined before. And more than that, and this is, this is where Doiling comes in, this is actually a, um, you, can, you can sort of define, you can characterize an elliptic curve by its endomorphism ring. So, um, an endomorphism ring of E is the same as the endomorphism ring of E prime up to conjugation. If and only if E prime is either isomorphic to E or to its Frobenius conjugate. Now, just to explain a little bit for people who are not familiar what the Frobenius conjugate is, I wrote down the Frobenius isogeny, which I've unfortunately just rubbed out, sorry, Frobenius endomorphism, which I've just rubbed out, which I said was an endomorphism when the curve is defined over FP. Now, when your curve is defined over FP squared, but not FP, then that map defines an isogeny. And the image of that isogeny is the Frobenius conjugate. So what you end up with is you end up with either um, so if your curve is defined over FP, then its endomorphism ring defines it uniquely up to isomorphism. And if it's defined over FP squared, then its endomorphism ring um, is defined it, uh, uh, not quite uniquely, but it's either that one or it's, or it's Rubinius conjugate. 
And so if you're moving from this graph to this graph, you can think of sort of folding this graph on the, um, on the subgraph where everything's defined in FP and you fold everything onto its Frobenius conjugate. And if you want to know more about that, then you should read a paper written by several people in the audience, I believe, at least Sarah, <laughs> who I can see smiling at me, um, which, is, which is very nice uh, and explicitly written down. So that's, um, that's how you go from this world to this world. Are there any questions about that? No? Okay. Well, All right. I have a question. Yeah. Your example had complex multiplication. Um, is that just the easiest one to write down? So if your elliptic curve doesn't have CM. Um... So in, um, it's the easiest one to write down this explicitly, but um, they will all have CM. Oh, that's nice. kind of, that's partly what this fact is saying here. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, okay, good. So how do you go from this world to this world? Uh, so I'm going to sort of give you a bit of a, an idea of how you might even associate a two by two erratic matrix with an isogeny. And then I'm going to give you an example of how to compute explicitly with these things and the sort of hand wave about what we want to do with that beyond that, because I won't have time for more than hand waving at that point, I think. Um, so I'm just I'm going to rub out this this middle part now. Okay, so um, I assume everybody here is at least fairly familiar with elliptic curves. So hopefully this first bit is, is not too is not too drastic. Um, so. We've talked about this, oh, I keep rubbing things out, I didn't mean to rub out. We've talked about this multiplication by L map and multiplication by N map for a general integer. And um, you probably also have seen before the definition of the torsion subgroup, which is the kernel of that map. So we're going to use that to uh, get to our, eventually get to our elliptic matrices. So if you've got a elliptic curve uh, defined over any field, then we define the L to the N torsion subgroup, which is written in this way with these square brackets, to be the kernel of um, the L to the multiplication by L to the N map on E. So this is an endomorphism. Um, I'm talking about everything over the algebraic closure here, right? So even if the elliptic curve is defined in FP or so, we think about um, all of the elements in the kernel of this endomorphism uh, defined over the algebraic closure of that uh, curve. And then as an abstract group, um, given that remember L is different from P, this is isomorphic to um, Z mod L to the NZ cross Z mod L to the NZ. So uh, maybe you remember it, at the beginning of the talk, I made a very sort of hand wavy comment about how it was obvious that our L isogeny graph was L plus one regular, and then realized that wasn't obvious at all and tried to brush that away. And um, so you can actually see it from here. Um, so each of our, uh, I did say that an L isogeny um, has kernel where the size of the, the size of the kernel is L. And also that uh, subgroup, that kernel subgroup has to be a subgroup of your elliptic curve of order L. So if you've got n equals one here, you're looking at um, all the possibilities for a subgroup of order L inside that elliptic curve have to be actually a subgroup of this thing here. So what you can equivalently do is you can count how many times, looking at abstract groups, Z mod LZ sits inside this product where n is one, Z mod LZ plus Z mod LZ, and that's L plus one, and that's actually your L plus one different isogenies. That's just an aside. I'm sorry, I got distracted. Okay, good. So, um, <laughs> so this is the, the L to the N torsion subgroup. And the reason I'm talking about, well, I'm talking here about 
third mod L to the n center. I'm talking here about elladic things, so that, that I want to go a little one step further. And that's how we get to something called the elladic tape module. Um, which is actually, it's not very complicated, it's just the inverse limit of, oops, I'm already writing my e backwards, not just my limits, um, of this L to the n torsion subgroup. Um, and as an abstract group, it turns out that you can uh, reverse limits and isomorphisms, who knew? And this is actually isomorphic to um, the eladic integers crossed with the eladic integers. Now, if you're feeling very savvy early on a Saturday morning for you guys, then you might already see um, somehow that if you've got, if you want to have a map from something in ZL cross ZL, something else in ZL cross ZL, well, that's quite likely to be a matrix with entries in QL, a two by two matrix with entries in QL. So this is how we're going to get to our two by two matrices. Um, so let me write that down. So suppose we have an ally such an E. Okay, between two elliptic curves. Then this is going to induce a degree L morphism on the L addict tape modules of E and E prime. Just going through these steps, right? Taking the subsequent kernels um, of this L to the N torsion map and the isogeny, the map that's um, induced on, on, those, on those kernels. So this is going to induce a map from the L addict tape module of E to the analytic tape module of E prime. And I told you that these things are isomorphic to ZL cross ZL. So there exists an isomorphism from TLE to ZL cross ZL. And there exists an isomorphism here from TLE prime to ZL cross ZL. And what you get is if you try and make this diagram commute, is you get an induced morphism from ZL cross ZL to ZL cross ZL. And that induced morphism will be a matrix coming from phi, which is um, in M to QL. And then you can make lots of very clever choices and read papers written by people much cleverer than me to see that these matrices will be the ones that I've written down over there. Now, so it's all very well to say that this works on an abstract level. Um, but the whole point of our paper, especially thinking about cryptography, is how can you translate your complicated picture with rational maps, etc., into something just in terms of matrices. So in the last two minutes, I just want to show you an example of how to do that. Oh, I told you the cat would come near the end. <laughs> He's ready for his dinner. Uh, here's his ear. <laughs> All right, good. So in order to see how to, how to compute an example, um, I need to just tell you one fact about how to compute isogenies in general. Uh, which I actually already said in words, but it's much easier to see things written down. So we've got an isogeny from E to E prime. This thing here, this is uniquely determined by its kernel. Oops. At least, you know, up to isomorphism, which is all we really care about because our graphs are up to isomorphism. The kernel is also isomorphic to Z mod LZ, which I also just said in words. And 
competing phi, the isogeny phi, and the codomain E prime, um, given E and the subgroup kernel phi, generated by a single point because it's a cyclic uh, subgroup, has complexity O of L. Now, because of this and the fact that it's uniquely determined, uh, what we often do is we use this sort of abusive notation where we say E prime is equal to E quotient this group generated by this P here. So it's a sort of coming from group theoretic no notation. Um, okay, so example of how to compute things. Um, how about if I want to say, I'm, I'm going to say compute the three, two isogenies of direction, right? So I, I wrote down, I, I'm going to call these different um, labels for the edges directions now. So I wrote down what they were before, but it's, so there's two isogenies, there's three of them, it's two plus one is three. And the matrices that we label the edges by are 1002, 1012, and 2001. And that's from a given E0. And very important for this uh, translation, a given basis of the two adic tape module of E0. I'm going to call PQ. To compute one step, so just one direction, we actually only need a basis of the two torsion, which is a lift of this chosen um, two adic um, basis. So we only need uh, E zero two is equal to P bar Q bar, where P bar and Q bar are, uh, sorry, where P and Q are lifts of P bar and Q bar to the, to the uh, two addicts. And the three directions just look like the following. All we do is we take um, so this direction one zero zero two. What we do is we just multiply on the left by p bar q bar, and then we're going to get uh, p bar and two q bar. Two q bar is the point at infinity because this was a two uh, or two torsion point, and then the remaining point p p bar is the kernel of the isogeny here. So this is E0 quotient, the group generated by P bar. And then we do the same thing with our other two directions and we get E0 quotient P bar plus Q bar. And here we get E0 quotient Q bar. And to go further in our tree, all we have to do is take a uh, higher um, higher order torsion um, generators of the torsion subgroup and just repeat this process over and over again. And how we've suggested to use that for cryptanalysis in that paper is, of course, you have to make a clever choice of P and Q. Um, but just to give a very simple example that maybe touches on something I already mentioned, um, you can choose, uh, for example, to have P be an FP rational point. Um, so P bar be an FP rational point for up to a very high power of two and Q bar be an FP, uh, FP squared rational point. And then the direction, which only has uh, multiples of P in the denominator, in the, in the kernel, um, is gonna stay in FP. So that's gonna show, show you this FP subgraph there. So you see these algebraic, um, algebraic pictures that, we, that we've sort of painstakingly worked out for the elliptic curve case coming out in a very obvious way in the Grote Tips story. Um, and what we're hoping to do now is, is use this to give a classification of the maximal orders um, that appear in the isogeny graph for a specific instance, which is useful for cryptanalysis. 
Right, I think I've run over a little bit, so I'll stop there. Sorry for running over five minutes. Woo! Thank you. Thank our speaker. Thank you very much. Excellent. And I'll stop the recording.